Hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning. It is good to be again in the house of our God. Welcome. To Frankfurt Methodist Church. Good morning. Uh, let's see, look at the announcements real quick. Uh, pastoral visitation cards are in the back. Scholarship forms are available. Uh, they are due May 15th. We do have a board meeting uh, Wednesday, 6 p.m. And choir practice, 7 p.m. Now, you do know that they could possibly move the county meet. They've got makeup days of Wednesday and Thursday, and it's not Tuesday. Tuesday's not working good. Tuesday's not working good, so. Wow. It's the Ross County track meet, so we may move the choir to 
to a different night. A different night. Yeah. So we'll see how the weather goes. The Ross County track meet, I guess, is the second oldest track meet in Ohio. Yes. So that's always been hosted here. Um, and that's here. Yes. Uh, let's see, June 4th, we will honor our graduates for 2023. And on uh, June 4th, also special music, Kim Artrip and Dalton Skeens will provide special music during the worship service. Are there any other announcements? Karen, you want to come up? Please. Thank you, Mr. I'm a little hoarse this morning, so uh, bear with me. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and voting on Sunday, and I'm um, really glad that we're pretty much all in agreement of what we're going through. Um, our date to exit is June 30th, so until then, we are United Methodist, and things can happen. It's happened in different conferences across the nation, so stay in prayer. We have to get through annual conference where there's a vote, and I'll be going to that um, on June 1st. We have to have the money to the conference hour office by the 15th of June to be able to get out on the 30th. <clears throat> and there's some other little loopholes. I got an email yesterday. They said the title search is in. They all looked fine. But he emailed me, he wanted pictures of uh, the actual titles. So I sent those this morning, because I actually have the actual title sitting in my house right now. Because I knew that's what would happen, that we meet him again out of the lockbox. So um, <clears throat> I just want to encourage everybody to, to stay in prayer about it. Um, our board meeting on Wednesday night will be over getting through all the paperwork that they've handed me. Um, there's a piece of paper here if you want to stay in United Methodist and you want um, your membership transferred to another church or it's transferred to the conference to decide which church you want it to go to. I'll leave that on the back table if anyone wants to sign that um, and we'll get that to conference um, <clears throat> by the end of next month. So there's um, contracts coming between the 1st and the 5th. I don't think there are anything, from what I've seen, I don't think there are anything different. I mean, there's pretty much a standard thing for all the churches. So, um, we have those things to look forward to. Um, we'll probably be having more meetings several times this, uh, um, between now and then so we can get all the things done. Our actually buyout estimate is $57,495, but this does not um, uh, reflect what the um, pension liability is, which will probably go down. They've not gotten those figures out. They were supposed to be out week before last, and they still haven't come out. So um, that might change some too, but that's what our buyout is. And um, I did have a CD come due on the um, scholarship money this week, and I renewed that at 5%. And I talked to him, and we can get a loan against the scholarship money from Edward Jones. It's a high rate if we need to, if we don't have the property sold with the money to be able to get to conference on time. So those are some things that we're going to be talking about at the board meeting. Anybody can come to the board meeting. Um, and I encourage anyone and everyone to, if you want to know what else is going on. Um, because there's no closed doors. There's no secret meetings. There's no secret handshake. Uh, anybody can come and, and um, share their knowledge. And please do, because Lee and I talked this week. He, he finally got the... Uh, the property, I don't know if it's quite listed, but he's talked to Derek, and Derek's working on it. So um, we had somebody else call about being interested in it, so that's two people that are interested that we know. So um, that's where we're at with that. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, call me anytime. Um, come to the board meeting and listen and share your two cents and share your, your wherever you're, Skills lie. We need 
and the help we can to get through this. Thank you. Yeah, I second what Karen was saying there, and just keep our eyes on God. Um, he's taken us this far, he has a plan for us, so there's, there's no reason to think we got all the answers, just keep following God. All right, let's do some singing this morning. Um, praise song will be page 158, Come Christians, Joy and Sing, and the opening hymn will be 428, For the Healing of the Nation. In 
The revelation we read of the great garden on either side of the river that flows from the throne of God and the trees on either side of that garden bear 12 different fruits and the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations. That's where that phrase comes from. Now we'll be reading all of Psalm 100 uh, for our responsive reading. Uh, Don't worry, it's short. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are the people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We are indeed his people, the sheep of his pasture. Uh, Now we turn to our uh, prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests. Whoop, choir. I'm sorry. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, we have Riley here. How awesome is that? I'd also like to welcome back Becky and Lee. It's so great to see you both. Thank you for coming.
Such a wonderful song. All right, uh, now, (laughs) my apologies, now we come to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. Yes? Jason and my mom, Irene. Jason and Irene. Okay, yes? Matt? We'll pray for Matt. Any others? Yes. Oh, Becky, go ahead. Um, thank you, everyone, for your love and support and prayers and the food that was brought on Monday was so wonderful. Thank you so much. Love you all. We love you. Terry. Okay. You said Ken Wade? Dan, my apologies, Dan, okay. I got one letter, right? <laughs> Any others? Yes. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> the blue state. And tomorrow she starts her job at an elementary school in Davis, Michigan. And she has been working there since So we'll pray for Katie, you said her name was? Well, um, please pray for Sean. Okay. Good. Good. We will pray for Katie and Sean. Any others? Oh my. Okay, we'll pray for Derek and Hannah. Are there any others? <laughs> oh, 
Okay. I want to thank Terry and we had a praise last night. Um, we fulfilled our duties with Delma at the confirmation at St. Mary's last night. And they were happy to have us uh, join their choir and we witnessed something I had never seen before. The whole confirmation process, we sang through all of it. Um, and they fed us so much food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Well, good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I looked at them this morning before church. They were, they're beautiful. So. Absolutely. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? If not, let's go before the throne. Great God, you are our shepherd. You are our leader. You are, you are God. You are the one who spoke existence into existence. You are the one who hung the earth on nothing. You are the one who called the mountains forth from below and tells the ocean, this far you shall go and no further. You are the one who hangs the stars in the sky and calls them each by name and not one of them is forgotten. You are amazing. You are great and glorious and holy. We're wonderful and perfect and pure and we bow in your presence. Lord, we enter your courts with Shouts of thanksgiving. We enter your throne room with praise. We lift our, our voices in song. We lift our hearts in worship because you are God and there is no other, there is no other appropriate response. We come before you in worship because it is the right thing to do. It is all that we can do in your holy presence. You are holy. You are true. You are God and you are God alone. And in your presence we kneel.
Blessed and holy Lord, we have sinned against heaven and against our fellow men. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have left undone those things we should have accomplished. And there is within us no peace. But blessed Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just. That you will forgive us of our trespasses and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, in these next few moments, in this holy place, surrounded by your holy people, in the privacy of our own hearts, we make our confession before you. And so, blessed Lord, through our confession and through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, we are forgiven. And it is truly marvelous in our sight. And now, Father, as a righteous and a redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those requests we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you those we have kept hidden in our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would be with Jason and with Irene, with Matt and Dan, with Katie and with Sean. Lord, we ask your blessing, your guidance, your will be done with those churches that are voting to disaffiliate yet. We ask your blessing on Derek and Hannah. Lord, we ask your continued guidance on our schools, the students and teachers and staff and administrators, Lord. We ask that you would continue to empower them for the good work to which you have called them and that they would finish the year in your will. Blessed Father, in this dark time, we ask your healing, your guidance, your blessing on our nation and its leaders. Not only ours, Lord, but the leaders of the whole world. We ask that peace would reign in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask that the guns would be silenced and the shouts of war would cease. Lord, we ask that you would reign on the earth and that your will would be done and that souls would be saved around the globe for the name of Jesus Christ. Finally, Father, we ask your blessing on Frankfurt Methodist Church, on the building, on the premises, on the people in the pews, Lord, we ask that you would use us for your great purpose. That even if and when our name changes, Lord, that our mission would not. That we would still be arrows in your quiver. We would still be workers in your field. That we would still be those gathering in the harvest of souls for Jesus Christ, who has bought us and saved us. And now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts, that we might know and speak 
and hear the wonderful, holy truths of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the anointed one who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask a couple of ushers to come forward, please. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, and now, if you would please, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 10 and verse 1. John 10 and 1. This is a very long reading. We're going to read another uh, 21 verses or so. Uh, so as with last week, if you would rather remain seated, please feel free. But... Once you've found the place, um, or if you're going to follow along on the screen, if you're able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. John chapter 10 and verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door of, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger, or of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. So Jesus said again to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, 
and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have the authority to lay it down, uh, and, I, I, uh, and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said to him, or said, uh, many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments, may you take these poor, humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your meaning. May you teach your people the message you would have them to hear, that above all things, Father, your name would be glorified. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. I've I've been um, trying to write my sermons on a <clears throat> on a pericope, a section of text um, divided from the other sections by a central idea or theme. And this speech that Jesus gives is the central idea or theme of this pericope. But every verse in that pericope could be its own sermon. I. I could and uh, very well likely should write a whole series on John chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 21. Um, And I say that to say this, I am not going to do that text justice. I just want to lay this out there. I'm not going to cover everything or most of it or half of it, but we are going to look carefully at some of the central ideas. Now, today is the fourth Sunday of our Easter celebration. And this morning, our text comes from some place we may not have initially suspected as an Easter passage. Each of the four Gospels has a central theme to it. They all tell the story of Jesus, of course, but each writer wants to focus on a different aspect of him. For example, Matthew was a Levite. His family was of the priestly tribe, and Matthew's gospel focuses, um, uh, focuses on and goes to great lengths to show that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Matthew begins his gospel, as we remember, with the genealogy of Jesus, beginning not at Adam, but at Abraham, who is thought of as the father of the Jewish people. Matthew's genealogy follows the line of Jesus' adopted father, Joseph, because Matthew is giving us a legal inheritance. In Matthew 2, we recall, Matthew gives us the story of the wise men coming from the east because they had seen the star. The wise men tell King Herod that they know that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem because, as we read in Micah 5.2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, uh, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, not to get too far into this, but Matthew spends much of his text examining the Jewish nature of Jesus and his early emphasis on the birthplace as a fulfillment of um, Micah's prophecy um, uh, serves that end. Now, Mark is not one of the apostles, but Mark is rather Peter's servant, He follows follows Peter and records Peter's story. When we say that Mark was Peter's servant, we get a a weird um, 
master-slave dynamic idea there, and that's not exactly the way it was. The, the better word is amanuensis. Slide. It's such a wonderful word. I had to make it its own slide. It's a word I, pr- I didn't know how to spell. I only knew how to pronounce, and um, I, I probably still don't know how to spell it, even though I'm staring at it. Uh, But it means one employed to write from dictation or to copy manuscript. And the point is that Mark wrote Peter's story and helped Peter's ministry. Mark's gospel focuses on the things that Jesus did. Mark doesn't include a birth narrative, uh, and Mark's favorite uh, word is immediately or straight away uh, to show quick and decisive action. Mark, who served Peter focuses on Jesus as the servant. Luke, we remember, was a physician. Luke's gospel then focuses on Jesus' humanity. Luke also includes genealogy, but Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam and goes through Jesus' only human parent, Mary, because Luke is focused on Jesus as a human. Uh, This is also why Luke indicates or includes the best birth narrative and why we read from Luke chapter 2 at every Christmas. So the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a similar perspective. We've gone over this before, so I'll just cover it briefly here. Uh, They are called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is a word which comes directly from the Greek and refers to the giving of an account of events from from the same point of view or looking similarly at an event uh, or, uh, or a life. So, uh, when the planes hit the World Trade Center in 2001, uh, if you were like me, you were flipping through the news channels looking for more coverage. They were showing the same footage over and over again, but slowly, new information leaked out. All of the news channels were covering the same event from the same perspective. That is synoptic. Um, Similarly, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because, some scholars believe, Matthew and Luke copied much of their material directly from Mark's Gospel. Uh, Upwards of 80% of Mark's Gospel appears word for word in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Uh, And then Matthew and Luke each added uh, his own, or their own material, Uh, Matthew adding his own remembrances, and Luke adding those details he obtained from his interviews of the other eyewitnesses. But John's gospel was the last gospel to be written. Now, we're starting to get closer to our primary text, right? Because John John is our primary text. And even antagonistic scholars, uh, such as uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, will date Mark, or will date John, or Mark, yeah, will date Mark, I'm sorry, as early as 45 A.D., uh, with Matthew and Luke... uh, written around 55 A.D. Sometimes you'll see those dates pushed back uh, about 10 years, but even the antagonistic scholars have a big problem in that they cannot push those dates any further back than 69 A.D. because in 70 A.D. the temple falls. And Jesus prophesied that the temple would fall. So if the author of the gospel witnessed the fulfillment of that prophecy, a major event in the history of Israel, they would have included it. It would be like writing a history of the city of New York uh, and not including the 9-11 story. Well, if you find a history of New York that doesn't include the Twin Towers falling on September 11th, you can conclude one of two things. One, the author is a bad historian and chooses not to include important events, or two, that the work was completed before September 11th of 2001. This is why um, even the antagonistic scholars who want to say, there are no eyewitness records written in the lifetime of eyewitnesses, have to also say that the synoptics were written before 70 A.D., John, on the other hand, was written in 96 A.D., 63 years after Jesus ascended. To this end, John tells a very different story. He tells of the miracles and of the teachings that the others omit. Why? Well, there's no reason 
for John to tell those stories again. They're already told. And at the point in which John is writing, those stories are in wide circulation. There are thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies already made and being passed around the world by 96 A.D. So outside of the resurrection, John includes only a single miracle that you can find in the other Gospels, and that is the feeding of the 5,000, because it had such a personal impact on John. Now, why are we chasing this rabbit trail? Why here, when our text is about the Good Shepherd and this, uh, and this, uh, and, and this rabbit trail that I'm, I'm, I'm running down about the, the, the Gospels and their authorship has seemingly nothing to do with that. Well, we, we said that Matthew wanted to show that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. We said that Mark wanted to show that Jesus was the suffering servant. We said that Luke wanted to show Jesus as being fully human. What is John's purpose? John tells us in the prologue of his gospel, as we read in John 1 and 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John tells us in his very first verse that his purpose is to show the divinity of Jesus Christ. John wants to show his readers in no uncertain terms that Jesus Christ is the incarnate deity, God in the flesh, the truest expression of God, of the God of Israel, on the earth. So John begins his gospel by saying, the word was with God, and the word was God. It, it, it's, it's hard to misunderstand that unless you try really hard, and, and there are groups that try really hard to do that. Now, because of that, John organizes his gospel around seven I am statements. These are in John 6 and 35, I am the bread of life. In 8 and 12, I am the light of the world. In 10 and 7, I am the door of the sheep. In 10 and 11, I am the good shepherd. In 11 and 25, I am the resurrection and the life. In 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in 15 and 1, I am the true vine. In each of these, Jesus is repeating the I am from Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, which says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, this fits perfectly with John's theme of presenting Jesus as God with us. Fully human, yes, but also fully divine. And with that prologue out of the way, now we'll start the sermon, right? Um, We're going to look at the central of these I am statements, the the middle one, the one, if if, if these were on a, a mountain, this would be the peak, I am the good shepherd. It's the statement from verse 20 of our primary text. Now there's, as usual, there's a lot of stuff in this text that I'm just not going to be able to get to, time being what it is. But the idea of Jesus as shepherd is, I think, a very important part, not only of this passage, but of the very identity of Jesus. You see, we as Christians call our leaders pastors. And that word comes directly to us from the Latin word, spelled the same way, um, which means shepherd. The shepherd is the leader of the flock, the one who takes care of it, the one who makes sure that the flock is fed, who gives of themselves for the well-being of the flock. Now, as we read in our call to worship this morning, the Lord is our shepherd. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our souls. The shepherd comforts and protects the sheep. The idea of the shepherd is central to Jewish thinking. Even before the captivity in Egypt, the patriarchs, the sons of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, were shepherds. 
It's, so it's quite natural to think that a leader of a group of people, like the rabbi in the synagogue or the pastor in the church, would be seen as a kind of shepherd. It's an analogy that we still use today whenever we call our religious leaders pastors. And so in Ezekiel chapter 34, uh, the prophet delivers a message from God to the shepherds of Israel. Now, I, I commend the whole chapter to you. Um, it's, uh, it's fascinating reading. But in verse 2 of Ezekiel 34, we find son of man, this is God's name for uh, the prophet Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? He's not talking to the men standing in the fields watching literal sheep. And we'll see that as we go on. Verse 3, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The religious teachers of Ezekiel's day, the pastors leading the sheep of Israel, were bad shepherds. They were pasturing themselves on the sheep. They were getting rich and fat off of them because power corrupts. It's a lesson we've seen time and time again. The temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day was similarly corrupted. Time doesn't permit me to tell of the Essenes, a group of priests who fled Jerusalem to live in the wilderness to escape the corruption of the temple priesthood. John was an Essene. John the Baptist was an Essene and um, lived in a, in a series of caves known, as, known today as, as Qumran. Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I also don't have enough time to tell of the way that those same priesthoods, those positions in the temple were awarded as a reward for helping in a battle rather than as the birthright of the sons of Aaron. I, I've spoken before about the sacrificial system on the Temple Mount where the priests would sell the animals to the people coming to make their sacrifices at marked up rates to line their pockets while pretending to do the Lord's work. And how Jesus, filled with righteous anger, twice in his ministry, overturned their tables and drove them from the Temple Mount. But, but the problem still persists today. Many leaders of large churches fill their pockets with the fat of the flock. All too often, men and women who preach, who used to preach the gospel, men and women who once told the truth of the gospel, now pervert the gospel into some prosperity teaching, telling people that God wants them to be rich and to live in bigger homes and drive prettier cars with a prettier spouse and, and to have all the things that their hearts desire. And all you have to do, all you have to do, dearly beloved, is sow that seed money to your preacher. Just put, I need $5,000 in the collection. Like $5,000. Anyone want to pretend you haven't heard that? These... Shepherds fatten themselves on the sheep. The idea of seed money that so many of them teach is just a new way to rob from those who cannot afford to give in order to make themselves rich. Selling the hope and blessing of God to pad their own bank accounts. From Ezekiel's day to ours, bad shepherds have been a plague on the people of God. And from Ezekiel's day to ours, the Lord is the solution. We resume our reading in Ezekiel 34 and 15. I myself, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy, I will feed them in justice. 
And how will the Lord accomplish this? If we keep reading, that was verse 16. If we keep reading in verse 22, he tells us, he says, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be a prince among them. I am the Lord. I love that phrase so much. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will send my servant David, the Lord says, and he shall feed the sheep. He will be their shepherd. And just to make it even more sure, the Lord affixes his holy name to it. Ani Yehovah. I am the Lord, he says. I have spoken. But what does it mean when the Lord says that he will send David? David lived a thousand years before Jesus. Ezekiel is writing 600 years before Jesus. David has been cold in the grave 400 years, or, or roughly 300 years. The, the, the Lord promised that David, or the Lord promised to David that his kingship would never end, that the line of David would reign forever, and the Jewish people were to look for that king. The Messiah, they said, would come from the house and line of David. And here, in this Ezekiel passage, the Lord promises. In Ezekiel 34 and 15, we read, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. He promises to send the Messiah. He promises to come himself. And these two things are not contradictory. In our primary text, we see the fulfillment of both promises. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We spoke earlier about the purposes for each of the Gospels. And we said that John's purpose was to show us that Jesus was God in the flesh. <clears throat> this is why John builds his Gospel around the seven I am statements. In each of them, Jesus is telling us, who he is. He is God. He is our shepherd. He is our pastor. We are his flock. We are the sheep of his pasture. He comes to us the right way, not by stealing his way in, not by sneaking over the back wall of the sheep pen, but walking straight through the gate. He stands on the mountaintops he reaches out with a nail-scarred hand, standing in front of you and says, I am here. You are not deceived. He's not lying to you. He's not, he's not a thief or a robber who opens the gate or who enters in the sheep pen by a different way. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Dearly beloved, the shepherd is calling you. He's calling to you every minute of every day. I saw a video this week that I, I shared on Facebook. If, if you want to find out what the sermon's about each week, just sort of follow my Facebook page. You'll, you'll get hints. But there was this wonderful video <clears throat> of uh, some, some people who had come to visit a sheepfold. And uh, the shepherd was standing there, and he told the people to, to call to the sheep, right? And, and these people would go up to the fence, and he, saw, he told them what to say. He told them the words that he uses to call the sheep. And each person would call out to the sheep. And it, wasn't matter, it, didn't, it didn't matter how loud they called out or, or how harmoniously they called out or how clearly they called out or how perfectly they said the words. The sheep kept grazing. And three or four people came up and they tried and, and they always went away giggling. And after the fourth person, the shepherd stepped up and he said the same words the first four people said. And the first time he said it, every sheep lifted their head. And the second time he said it, every sheep came running from all over the field. 
The sheep know the shepherd's voice. They hear him. He calls to them by name and they come running. How will you respond? When the shepherd calls your name, how will you respond? Will you lift your head? Will you come running to the voice of the shepherd? Will you hear his voice and recognize it, or will you take your own chances with the wolves? He has come that you may have life and have it abundantly, and that, dearly beloved, is good news indeed. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Gracious Master, teach us to respond to the call of your voice. May we hear you. May we lift our heads. May we come running the moment you speak. May we set aside ourselves and do your will. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, turn in our hymnal to an incredibly appropriate hymn, number 381, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
I want her to... Um, uh, I, I saw a video where the Reverend Dr. John MacArthur, president of the Master's College and Seminary, isn't that a title, uh, was taking questions from his congregation. He's been the pastor at Lakewood Community Church in California for 50 years now or so, and um, someone asked him how much authority the pastor has in the lives of the congregants. And the Reverend Dr. John MacArthur, president of the Master's College and Seminary and pastor of Lakewood Community Church for 50 years, chuckled and shook his head, and he said, none. I'm not your shepherd. We have one shepherd. And I'm really glad to hear that answer because that's what I was thinking too. And I trust the Reverend Dr. John MacArthur, president of the Master's College and Seminary and pastor of Lakewood Community Church for 50 years. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his counsel, countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Okay, board members in the back. So good to see you again. God bless. Thank you. Good to be here.